Good morning, church. Uh, I've been a pastor of this church for almost 30 years, and I finally found somebody to help me with my table. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, I want you to open to Acts chapter 2. We're going to springboard from Acts chapter 2 to 2 Peter chapter 1 toward the end of the message, but we will begin in Acts 2. Today, we're going to wind down and wrap up a rather lengthy series of messages that we chose to call Core 101. Now, we have covered over the past several weeks the basic, and when I say basic, I don't mean simple, I mean fundamental. The basic principles, the core fundamental principles of following Jesus Christ. So we've talked about things like prayer, we've talked about the Holy Spirit, we've talked about authentic faith. Last time, Tyler spoke about the process of of the faith walk, which is called sanctification, and it takes time. Today, last but not least, we're going to talk about the church. Now, I need to be up front with you uh, before I do this. What I'm about to do is probably going to make some of you uncomfortable. Uh, Forgive me. I don't go into it with the idea of making people uncomfortable. That's not my goal, trust me. But sometimes in the church, things need to be said, And I'm willing to say them. In fact, as we discussed this message with the staff in a meeting this week, I started to retitle it. I started to call it The Church and Who Should Leave It. Over the years, many people have left this church. I want to talk about that today. For instance, this is the Whitlock family. The Whitlock family left this church several years ago because they did not approve of my using secular images of us playing secular music on stage or using secular videos to set up a message in a, quote, worship service. That offended them, and they left. This is the Lackey family. The Lackey family left this church because he decided the best thing we needed to do, he was willing to buy a school bus He wanted to buy a school bus, and the church then was going to take this school bus out into the community, and we're going to pick up as many children as possible, and we're going to bring them to church. When I said, Tom, no, we're not going to do that, I'm sorry, he got offended, and they left the church. This is the Pryor family. The Pryor family attended our church for two years, but I did not preach hell, fire, and damnation often enough to suit them because they believed it was a strong motivator into the kingdom of God, and so they left this church. This is the Shorter family. The Shorter family didn't like our music. It was too loud. It was too progressive. They simply didn't like it. And this, finally, is the Sizemore family. The Sizemore family had been around a long time, but they left this church finally because we just don't go deep enough in this church to suit them. I had a conversation, and that was the word, deep. Pastor, we don't go deep enough. Now, everybody take a deep breath. Let it out. Everybody relax, because that's all made up. Those aren't real families in our church, and those are generic Google pictures that we pulled off the internet. However, listen, the reasons for leaving the church are real, as real as I'm standing before you today. You see, sadly, the reasons people have for leaving churches reveal that they've never gained an appreciation for what the church is all about anyway. The reasons for people leave churches reveal to me that they've never understood the nature and the purpose of of the New Testament church. Hear me, gang. I believe God is waiting. He's itching to bless churches who grasp the purpose of church. You see, most of what happens in church happens out there, not in here. Let me say that again. Most of real, true, biblical church is supposed to happen out there not in here. And when we get that confused, we get everything confused. You see, that's why the New Testament calls the church the body of Christ. Did you know that? In your New Testament, the church is referred to as the body of Christ. Well, what does that mean? That means we're supposed to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. Not in here, out there. The body of Christ are the eyes and the ears of of Jesus, but not in here, out there. You get it? Out there, we're supposed to love like Christ. Out there, we're supposed to serve like Christ. 
Forgive like Christ. Seek righteousness like Christ. Overcome temptation like Christ. Problem solve like Christ. Not just in here, but more specifically, more importantly, out there. I believe it all started in the 1980s. Because I'm old enough to look back now and I can see a, an evolution of the church, especially in America. In the 1980s and the 1990s, the church began to turn in on itself. We became consumers of church. We got wrapped up in what I'd like to call a fulfillment fixation. You see, follow me. We're out there and our jobs just aren't as fulfilling as we'd hoped. <clears throat> We, all the stuff we involve our kids in, it's just not as fulfilling as we'd hoped. Mm. All our recreation, all of our travel, weekends at the lake, it's just not as fulfilling as we'd hoped. Mm. So we set our eyes on the church. Maybe the church can fulfill me. So we started making the church about us in here, not them out there. That's when every church in America went out and bought one of these. <laughs> a church bus. Pastor, do you realize if we had a church bus, we could gather up all the senior adults in our church, we could take them out for the fish buffet on Friday nights. That'd be awesome. Pastor, if we had a church bus, you know what we could do? We could load up all the ladies and drive to Atlanta for a women's conference. Wouldn't that be great? Pastor, if we had a church bus, you know what we could do? We could put all our young people on the bus and take them to the beach during the summer. When they're out of school, it'll keep them busy and they won't get in trouble. Wouldn't that be great? You see where I'm going with this? Pastor, you know what our church needs? Our church needs to do more for the homeless, more for the impoverished in our community. Pastor, our church needs to offer more to our kids. Our church needs to offer more to my students. Pastor, I wish the church cared more for people who are in need. Pastor, I wish the church had a singles group where we could mingle and find love. Pastor, I wish we had a, 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 a college and career group. Pastor, I wish we had a senior adult group. Pastor, I wish we could organize a boycott of Disney+. Plus. That's what I wish. Pastor, I wish we could w talk more about the political landscape and the division in our nature. Now, I'm about to say something, and I don't want to be rude. I'm not a rude person, but hear me. The New Testament church does not exist to make your great idea happen. It just doesn't. Those are all good ideas, but that's not, according to this book, why the New Testament church exists. People have less, left this church and others like it because we refuse to make their great idea happen. But you see, that's not why the church exists. That's not what the New Testament church is all about. Are you familiar what the early first century church was all about? Have you ever read the book of Acts? Because that is a book of history, the history of the first century early church and the momentum it gained as it grew into a revolution that literally, gang, changed the world. How different that church is from today's mega churches, today's traditional churches with our, our professional staff and our theatrical lighting and sound and technical engineering, our over-the-top uh, children's ministries and student ministries. The first century church, when they gathered, they gathered on Sundays. This was different, not Saturdays. They were used to, as Jews, meeting on Saturdays in observance of the Sabbath. But the New Testament church changed it to Sunday in honor of Christ's resurrection on Sunday morning. When they gathered, they sang together. The Bible says they sang psalms straight out of the Old Testament, psalms. They sang spiritual songs and they sang hymns. They began reading from the letters when they would gather. They're 15, 20 years after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. The apostles had begun writing the New Testament. And so these letters began circulating among the churches and they would copy down their own copy of Paul's letter or Peter's letter or John's gospel. That's why we have so many early copies of the original autographs is because they were being circulated in the church. And then they would pray for each other when they gathered. They'd pray for one another. They'd pray for the mission of the church as well. But hear me. Everything else the church accomplished, they accomplished out there, not in here. 
Those were the beginnings of the early church. The apostles took the words of Christ, we call it the Great Commission, they took that Great Commission to heart, and the church was the result. Jesus said, go and make disciples, go and make disciples, and Matthew, and, and Mark, and, and John, and Peter said, aye, aye, sir. Look at uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Luke records, they devoted themselves, they being the church the followers of Jesus. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's instruction, and it's very important in the church, and to fellowship, that's important too, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. We would call that worship at the many wonders and signs that were performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. We would call that ministry. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We would call that evangelism. Did you notice those five primary directives? That's what fueled the early church. Those are the same five purposes or missions of Grace Community Church. The environments and the methods, the culture has certainly changed from then until now, but those five directives must remain the same. But there's one gigantic exception. There's one gigantic difference between the first century church and our church today. Even if we hold fast to ministry... Worship, instruction, fellowship, evangelism, even if that's the building blocks upon which our church will go, there's one big difference between theirs and ours. Here it is. Then, true biblical New Testament church happened out there. And when they gathered, they called that worship. You see? To them back then, true church happened out there. When they came together in here, they called that worship. Today, we call the gathering worship, or excuse me, church. We call the gathering church, and what happens out there, well, that's left to the professionals. We call, when we gather on Sunday for one hour, church. And what happens out there, we leave to the professional ministers. You see, The first century followers of Jesus Christ knew that Jesus had changed everything. He had brought light into a darkened world. And their personal relationship or their personal experience with God impacted them. It impacted their home. It impacted their marriage. It impacted their family. It impacted their communities. Today, we've become consumers of church. We consume church just like we would consume any other goods or products. We turn inward on ourselves. We gather and we call it church in a church that offers us the most, a church that we like the most, and then we leave the real ministry of the church, purpose of the church, to the professional ministers. That's what we do today. Pastor, my neighbor is a single mom. Our church should organize an outreach for single moms. Single parents need our help. That's a great idea. Pastor, my coworker broke his hip. Our church should organize a meal team, maybe a yard crew team, to go over there and provide meals and and cut the grass for the next few weeks until he gets back on his feet. That's a good idea. Pastor, my brother-in-law is in the hospital. Our church should send someone over there to pray with him. That's a great idea. But you notice something similar about every example I offer? The professional ministers are the ones who are supposed to be doing the ministering in the eyes of a consumer-driven church. Again, let me say it very politely, as kindly as I can say it. I'll lower my voice this time. The New Testament true biblical church does not exist to make your great idea or mine become a reality. That's not why we're here. Everything I mentioned a moment ago is a great idea. It's a wonderful idea, but that's not true biblical New Testament church. It's one small part of church. It's ministry, 
But a true biblical New Testament church has more than one minister, more than two ministers. You see, this church has more than Mike and Tyler, Paulette and Amy, Chad and Chris. This church has hundreds of ministers. This church has more than two ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church has hundreds of ministers. I'm just the leader. I'm just the head minister. You know what my job is, technically? My job is to equip you to be a minister to take church out there. That's my job. That's why you pay me. You pay me to equip you to take biblical church out there. That's been our goal from the beginning. In fact, that's the main point this morning. If you haven't figured it out yet, true biblical church happens out there, not in here. That's been my goal from the very first service in 1995. And you know, incidentally, since then, I've never once been happy about the numbers of people who show up in worship services. I've never once been happy. When the church was small, I wasn't happy. When the church was medium-sized, I wasn't happy. When the church got big, I wasn't happy. There have always supposedly or supposed to have been more people coming to worship on Sunday to fit my taste than have ever been. I always expect more, but follow me, it's never been about the crowds on Sunday anyway. Not even from the beginning. Not even when we were only 25 strong. It's never been about the numbers. When I receive an attendance report report during the week, I've never looked at it and said, bam, that's awesome. Never, never. Because it's never been about the size of the crowd. It's been about the mission of the church. It's been about changed lives who take their church out there. You see, by the numbers, this is a very successful church. I don't know if you know this or not. In the last 50 years in America, 80% of all church startups fail in the first two years. 80%. And the difference between a church startup like this one and a church plant like some others is we had no mother church. We had no guarantee of financing. We had no promise of participation. I felt as if God was leading me to start a church, and so we did. 80% fail in the first two years. Follow me. Of the 20% that remain after two years, less than 10% of those ever grow beyond 100 people. So by the numbers, Grace Community Church is a very successful church. But that's not the point. The Great Commission and the purpose of the church is. So let me ask you a very basic question. What is the church? What is the church? How would you answer that question? I mean, obviously, we all know it's more than a building. It's more than grounds or a campus. It's got to be more than dusty theology and old doctrine. Someone might say, I believe the church is a lighthouse in its community. I'll go along with that good answer. Someone else might say, I believe church is a gathering place for followers of Jesus Christ. Okay, I'll give you that. That's a good answer. But what is the church? Here's what I believe. What we, the leadership of this church, believe. A close examination of the ministry of Jesus Christ and the apostles' teaching in the rest of the New Testament reveal the church is really a table. It's a table where three kinds of people come to be fed. The church is a many, many things, but at a very basic level, The church is a table where people come to get fed. Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 35, he said, I am the bread of life. You come to me and you'll never be hungry. It's one of seven I am statements that Jesus made about himself. John 6, 35, I'm the bread of life. John chapter 8 and verse 12, I'm the light of the world. John chapter 10 and verse 7, I'm the gate for the sheep. John chapter 10 and verse 14, I am the good shepherd of the sheep. John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And finally, John chapter 15 and verse 1, I am the true vine. Seven statements that reveal the character and nature of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the very first one 
is I am the bread of life. Were we to turn to John chapter 6, you'd find in the first 10 verses or so, that's where Jesus feeds 5,000 people with, guess what? Bread. Bread and a few fish. When Jesus said in verse 35, I'm the bread of life, his crowd understood the connection. The audience could see the connection. The audience, primarily being Jewish, could look back to their own heritage of the Old Testament when God provided for his people as they wandered through the desert in the Exodus. Remember, they would wake up in the morning, they'd wipe their eyes, they'd step out of the tent, and bread would be laying all over the ground. The Bible calls it manna that came from God. So when Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, he's saying, just as God sustained his people, your forefathers in the Old Testament, during the deliverance of the Exodus, I can sustain you today. But it's more than just bread for your stomach today on a Tuesday at 515. It's eternal bread, because if you take my bread, you'll never go hungry. Then at the very end of his ministry, he's Risen from the dead, he spent 40 days with his closest followers. He looks at his closest followers, we would call them the disciples or the apostles, and he gives them the great commission. It comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. He said, now I want you to go, and I want you to make disciples of all nations, and I want you to baptize them and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. That is the purpose and the mission of the church. Had Jesus not said that, the church as we know it would never have existed. Had Jesus not offered the Great Commission, given instructions to his closest followers, the church revolution would never have occurred. Now, I told you earlier, the church is a table where three kinds of people come to get fed. Let's consider this my seat. I'm the leader, the staff, the leadership of the church. We occupy this seat at the head of the table. It's our responsibility to prepare the meal. It's our responsibility to equip the people who come to the table. In that chair is someone we'll call a skeptic or a seeker. This person is searching for something. And there are seekers in our services every weekend. There are skeptics in our services every weekend who aren't sure they buy into anything in this book. They're not sure they trust me. They're not sure they believe what I'm saying. Every Sunday at Grace Community Church, I can look around the auditorium because I know so many of you and I know so many of your stories and we've had the conversation. There are seekers and skeptics who have yet to buy into the gospel of Jesus Christ and they're here every week. Jesus said, go and make disciples out of those people. Baptize them. You see, who do you make disciple of? Who do you baptize? Somebody who hasn't been a disciple. Somebody who's never been baptized. A seeker or a skeptic. Once that seeker or skeptic stands up, steps over the line, embraces authentic faith in Jesus Christ, they move into this chair. We'll call that chair the chair of the new believer. They're brand new at faith. They're hungry. They've come to church to eat. They show up at the table week after week because they're looking to grow. Jesus said, once you make a disciple and baptize them, now I want you to teach them everything I've commanded you. Let me tell you something. That seeker, he's not interested in obedience. That skeptic, he's not interested in obeying Jesus Christ, learning what Christ expects, but a new believer is. Once a new believer begins to grow in their faith, they become more established. They get out of that chair and they get in this chair. We'll call this chair the Christ follower. At Grace Community Church, there are many, many, many devoted followers of Jesus Christ. They've been at it for a long time. It's our responsibility as Christ followers to reach out to the seekers, to embrace the skeptics, to make them feel welcome to help and serve the new believers. Look, there's a beautiful picture of this in 2 Peter chapter 1. Read with me beginning in verse 3. I don't have a lot of time, but follow me quickly. Here we go. Verse 3 of 2 Peter 1. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Whew, that's a lot of words. Let me tell you who they're directed to. They're directed to the new believer. 
New believer, or excuse me, skeptic or seeker. They're directed to you. If you're a seeker, if you've yet to buy in, if you're a skeptic, you've yet to step over the line and embrace authentic faith, verse 3 is written for you. Don't you know that God's divine power has given us everything we need? You see, my friend, without Jesus Christ, you do not have everything you need. I can't say it any plainer than that. You need to respond to the promises, verse 4, so that through his glory and goodness, through these, his glory and goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world that's caused by our own evil desires. You see, Jesus Christ is the end to our spiritual search for meaning. Participation in the divine nature is what it's all about. You see, how do you build a strong marriage? By participating in the divine nature. That's how you do it. With God's help, participating, responding to the promises. You participate in the divine nature, and you build a rock-solid home. You solve problems. You help others. Verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. That's addition. Sounds like growth, right? Make every effort to grow, to add to your faith. That could easily be written, verses 5 through 7, to the new believer. Watch this. Add uh, goodness, and to goodness, add knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. In here? Well, yeah, but only for an hour a week. Where it really becomes meaningful is out there. Where these things really shine is out there. Verse 9. Excuse me, verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, you will be, you, that will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, and they've forgotten that they've been cleansed from their past sins. Verses 8 and 9 could easily be written to the follower of Christ. It's a warning. Don't be ineffective. Don't be unproductive. Don't turn the focus of the church in on itself. The only way you're you're productive, the only way you're effective is to push away from the table and serve the new believer. Care for the skeptic. Reach out to the seeker. It's our responsibility. Verse 10. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. That is a reference to authentic faith. Confirm that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look, very quickly, this is how the church should work, and I'll quit. Seekers and skeptics respond to the promises. They get up. They move over. They become new believers who now add to their faith. They grow. We get them in a small group. We teach them how to do a daily quiet time. They worship regularly with us. They're committed to it on Sundays. They grow. They establish themselves. They get up and they move over. Followers of Jesus Christ who've been at it for a while, they own the responsibility. They do not wish to become unproductive or ineffective. They push away from the table and they serve and benefit seekers, skeptics, and new believers. You see, a church where everybody's moving around the table, that's a healthy church. That is a healthy church. Churches who consume church and turn it in on themselves expect everybody to sit in the same seat. The day Grace Community Church stops attracting that person or that person is the day we start dying. So when the seeker or the skeptic brings all their baggage into the church, man, they're on their fourth marriage, for goodness sakes. They've got financial problems. Their kids don't respect them, and they haven't spoken to them in three years. When they show up and sit next to you, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, break your neck to make them as comfortable as you can. Make them feel as welcome as they possibly could, because that is the mission of the church. Everybody here, regardless of where you sit, I want you to understand there's a seat empty next to you. There's the opportunity for you to move. There's the opportunity as a seeker, to buy in. You need to respond to the promises of God because that's the only way you'll ever participate in the divine nature. Get up, move over. If you're a new believer, grow in your faith. Add to it. And if you're a follower of Christ, reach out. 
to those around you. You know, there are two ladies in this church, two Christ followers who've been at it for a very long time. They are established in their faith, and to my knowledge, every Thursday for the past 15 years, these two older women have had lunch with younger women. They do Bible study and prayer, and they do it religiously and repetitively. Why? Because these two in this seat understand the church isn't about what goes on in here. It's about what happens out there. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us construct a strong church that is biblical in nature, that revolves around the purposes and the missions that are so very important. But in a very simple and straightforward way, teach us all the value of taking our church out there and not leaving it it in here. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, Grace Community Church. I hope you make it a fantastic week. I will see you next time.